This course is on integrated pest management of insect pests of alfalfa. My name is Ken Wise and I'm the New York State IPM Area Specialist for Livestock and Field Crops. In this course today we will cover alfalfa weevil, potato leaf hopper, clover root cuculeo, aphids, and alfalfa snout beetle. Many ask what is integrated pest management and there are several definitions of integrated pest management but in general it is using multiple tactics to control a pest before it reaches an economic injury level or threshold. These would include biological control, organic control, cultural control, mechanical and as a last option chemical controls. There are steps to an integrated pest management program, the first being preparation, making sure you have the right materials and knowledge to be able to go into a field and perform these other steps. So it could be um, an integrated pest management guide, resources online, um, books, um, anything that's going to help you with that uh, pest. Secondly would be you need to know what you're looking at and properly identify the pest. A lot of times mismanagement occurs when uh, insects are misidentified. The next step is how to sample for different uh, insect pests. There are different ways of sampling and you will see throughout this um, course that uh, we do sample certain pests different ways. And then once you sample, you have to take and analyze that data. And in scouting for pests, we have different ways, again, of, of determining whether you're at an economic threshold, which is the point at which you should control a pest before it actually causes you damage. After that, you need to know if you do reach this economic threshold, what are the management alternatives uh, for that pest? And there are several, and we'll go through them as we go through the pests. Once you determine what you're going to do, you need to implement it. Implementation is just the mere fact of taking the management action and putting it into action. Once you have uh, implemented the management practice, you will have to go back and reevaluate uh, what you had done. So say say you had reached an economic threshold for a potato leafhopper, you went in and sprayed, the, the best thing to do is to go back and make sure that it did what it was supposed to do. This is a classical pyramid of IPM tactics, the bottom being your foundation as you move up uh, towards uh, the top. So again, cultural control is basically uh, practices like rotation, breaking the, the pest cycle and, and by rotating, you know, altering the planting date for certain types of pests and diseases, you know, is your soil um, nutrient levels at the right uh, proportions or is your pH correct, you know, what plant populations would you want to plant at, um, you know, sanitizing a field can be an issue for certain diseases, so you may need to till it under. Um, those are all cultural practices. Physical or mechanical control could be, you know, the mere fact that you decide that you're going to go in and harvest, a, uh, you know, your alfalfa early to control a certain pest because it has reached an economic threshold. Could be cultivation under certain um, types of crops, tillage, rotary hoeing. You could have trapping of certain pests. Those are all mechanical controls. Next is a very important aspect of IPM and that is host plant resistance and this is the point at which the crops are bred to resist the pressure of a certain insect pest or possibly a disease. Biological control is the use of predators, parasitoids or parasites um, and diseases that either feed on the insect pest and or infect that insect pest. These can occur naturally or you can actually augment the population of these types of biological control agents in the fields. 
Next is chemical control. And there are two types. There's the biorationals and there's the conventionals. So the biorationals will be more specific to a certain pest. Um, it will have less impact on the environment. So these could be like BT spray for um, certain types of moth pests or beetles, um, insect growth regulators, and microbials. If those, if there's not an available one of those, then you would have to use a conventional pesticide if you're not in an organic situation. IPM starts with good crop management. As with any crop, you want to have a well-drained uh, planting site. Uh, make sure that you have a good rotation uh, within those fields that you maintain for alfalfa at least at 6.5 or above um, pH. Um, use appropriate variety, you know, if it's got disease resistance, uh, good fall dormancy ratings, you know, could have potato leaf hopper resistance. Um, and other traits that you want in your forage for your animals. Make sure you have good seabed preparation when you actually plant the crop. You know, make sure you have timely planting and um, good timely harvesting of the, of the crop at the proper stages. This will help create a healthier crop and when you do get a pest it will help withstand some of the pest pressure that it may exude on the, on the alfalfa. Before we get started with the insect pests, it is good to point out that uh, protecting pollinators is very important uh, for our agricultural ecosystem. You know that they pollinate about 130 different crops. Um, the value of pollination nationally is about 15 billion dollars. Um, and pollinators are very sensitive to many pesticides, which include insecticides, and we're finding some fungicides and spray adjuvants even uh, can affect the uh, bees. When protecting pollinators, make sure you use an IPM approach when selecting any preventative or control measure. Make sure you read and adhere to the pesticide label. And if possible, select an insecticide or fungicide that is safer for bees. You can look for the bee hazard warning on the label to see whether it is highly toxic to uh, pollinators or not. It is good to develop a communication network in local areas so that farmers can contact the beekeepers near their field before they start spraying. Farmers should notify beekeepers in an area when they are going to spray so that the beekeepers can protect their bees from the possible exposure. Some of the management practices around um, spraying and protecting bees are try to spray in the evening when bees are returning to their hives. Beekeepers should either move or cover their hives if there is going to be an application nearby. It is extremely important that you be aware of the wind speed when spraying because this can drift off site and can infect bees and or other organisms that could possibly be affected by the insecticide. Also be aware of any hives near the field and other flowering habitat uh, along hedgerows or along the edge of fields. So our first pest will be alfalfa weevil. Adult alfalfa weevil overwinters along field edges, in hedgerows, and other places where they can find shelter for the winter. In the spring, as the temperatures start to warm, they move back into the alfalfa. An adult alfalfa weevil is about 3 16 of an inch long. Alfalfa weevil are brown little beetles, or as we call them weevils, because they have like a snout projection from their head and on that snout as you can see from the photo there is antennae attached to it. With alfalfa weevil there is also a dark stripe running right down its back. Female alfalfa weevils can lay up to 1500 eggs in clusters of a few to 40 with inside a stem. A female will chew a small hole about a sixteenth of an inch and again lay between 1 and 40 eggs 
with inside the stem. So when they lay the eggs inside the stem, they're kind of a light yellowish color. And in time, they will turn brown with a dark spot at the apex of the, of the egg. And generally, depending on the temperature, they will hatch from 7 to 10 days. Alfalfa weevil larvae are kind of a light green with a white stripe running down their back with dark black heads. Alfalfa weevil larvae start to show up at about 300 degree days and that's with a base 48 temperature. And they will move directly into the buds of the alfalfa. Alfalfa weevil larvae cause the damage to the alfalfa. And so when they are in the bud, and they are tiny and small, they will drill through the bud, leaving what you can see in this photo as kind of like a shot hole uh, in the leaflets. As you can see from the photo, when populations are high, it can cause quite the damage to your alfalfa. Once alfalfa weevils have reached their final instar, they stop feeding and develop this cocoon where they create webbing and they kind of pull the leaf lit of the alfalfa around itself to protect itself. So in reviewing the life cycle of alfalfa weevil, it starts in um, you know late March in through April where the adults come back into the field and um, start laying eggs from about mid-April through May and then larvae hatch um, until you know late May they pupate and then in the summer the adults become dormant and then in late summer and towards fall they go looking for shelter for the winter. You can calculate at what life stage alfalfa weevil will be in by determining the degree days for it. By starting at March 1st you take the daily maximum temperature plus a daily minimum temperature and divide that by 2 which gives you the average daily temperature. Next you take the average daily temperature and subtract that from the 48 degrees which is the alfalfa weevil base temperature. This gives you your daily degree days for alfalfa weevil. Instead of doing all those calculations by hand you can have an online calculator do that for you for alfalfa weevil degree days. The Network for Environment and Weather Applications at Cornell University has an actual calculator uh, that you can use to determine uh, degree days near where your farm is. After calculating the degree days, you can determine when the alfalfa weevil eggs would hatch, when you start seeing the first instar larvae, um, the second instar, and by using this, you can determine when you need to be in the field scouting uh, the alfalfa. So when scouting for alfalfa weevil, you want to pick 50 stems at random throughout the field. You want to look for the small shot holes in the leaflets that indicates there is feeding on the, on the plant. And record the alfalfa stems that show any shot hole in the top three inches of the stem. When collecting stems or monitoring any type of insect pest in the field, try to use a random pattern off the edge of the field about 30 to 40 feet. Sometimes the edge of a field uh, can have a higher or lower amount of the population of an insect than would be more representative across a whole field. The action threshold from the number of stems you collected that have shot holes in the top three inches is 40%. Occasionally, you can have a problem with alfalfa weevil after first cutting on the regrowth. And so there is an action threshold for this, which is 50% of the stems are showing foliar damage and there are two plus larvae per crown. So if you have reached a threshold and you're within a week of your scheduled harvest, it's best to go in and harvest that right away if you can get in the field. First harvest normally controls alfalfa weevil. 
There are natural enemies to alfalfa weevil, and one of these are parasitoids. And there are two species of parasitoids that lay their eggs inside the larvae and they slowly feed on the inside of the alfalfa weevil larvae until they pupate. And at this point, the, uh, the parasitoid is fed enough that it has killed the, um, the alfalfa weevil. And then instead of the pupa of the larvae in the cocoon, you have the pupa of the parasitoid. And these are two pictures of the of the pupa of the parasitoid. Alfalfa weevil used to be the worst pest of alfalfa across the country. The USDA did a lot of research and found different parasitoids that can infect uh, the alfalfa weevil back in the late 60s and early 70s. And these are two of the uh, species that they released that uh, has dramatically affected the population of alfalfa weevil, uh, at least in the northeast. There are several different types of diseases that can also kill alfalfa weevil within a field. And there are predators that can actually feed on the larvae in the field, such as this predatory stink bug. If an insecticide is needed, Please consult your Cornell Guide for Integrated Crop Management to select the proper one. The next insect pest we will discuss is potato leafhopper. Potato leafhopper is a migratory pest. It overwinters in the southern United States and migrates north on storms in late May into June. Adults and nymphs are very active pests. Females will lay eggs in plant veins of about two to three per day for six to eight weeks. Uh, eggs hatch in about seven to ten days. Um, each individual can live up to about uh, 28 days. And again, in the fall, they will migrate back to the south. Adults are about an eighth of an inch long, lime green, and very strong flyers. Nymphs are kind of a yellowish green. Um, they don't fly, but they do move rather rapidly. Um, and again, the nymphs look very similar to the adults. They just don't have the wings. So both the nymph and the adult have piercing sucking mouth parts. And what they do is they put that into the phloem of the leaflet and, they're pull and they suck out the, uh, the sugary fluids in, within that uh, phloem and then they replace it with their saliva. This saliva is toxic to the plant. When you get too many of them on the plant at any one time, you start to see this V-shaped yellowing at the end of the leaflet as pointed with by the arrow. At this point, when you start to see the V-shaped yellowing across the field, uh, you've reduced your crude protein by 5% and dry matter by 40%, which is about a half a ton of alfalfa per acre for that individual cutting. With this damage, you can also have delayed regrowth and um, an increase in, in the chance of winter kill because of the uh, plant's ability not to put carbohydrates into the roots because it was dealing with the damage that, that occurred. So how do you avoid damage by potato leafhopper? What you need to do is go out and scout a field and determine whether you're at, a, at an economic threshold. You will start sampling in early June um, after the first cutting until about the first frost. You will want to sample weekly um, and you want to use a 15 inch diameter sweep net and a sequential sampling plan, which I will explain in future slides here. You will need to take a number of samples. And what we call one sample is 10 sweeps of the sweep net in front of you. And what you want to do is sweep the top six inches of the plants as viewed here in the video. your sampling powder each time you go into a field. And again, you'll want to be off the edge of the field, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet. We have different thresholds 
for different heights of plants within a field. Smaller plants are at higher risk than larger plants. New seedings are actually the most vulnerable to potato leaf hopper. That's why we have different thresholds for different heights of plants. Scouted many years ago, what you do is you go in and measure the height of the plants in several locations uh, around the field and determine uh, what category you want to put this in, whether it is at less than 3, 3 to 6 inches, 7 to 10, or above 10 inches. Once you determine that, then you'll want to take your first sample. You will count the number of potato leaf hoppers within the net for your first sample. You have to take at least two samples to make any kind of decision. So the N up there stands for no treatment needed or management I guess you could say also no management needed and T stands for treatment or management needed. So in this example we caught five potato leaf hoppers in the first sample, six in the second sample and our running total there is 11. In our third sample we got five more potato leaf hoppers which was a running total of 16. So the next step you want to do is to look across on your category to your third sample at three to six inches which was the height of the alfalfa and as you can see n is nine which 16 is above n so it's not below threshold t or treatment is 20 but it's not that high so it falls between the 9 and the 20 which means you need to move on to the next sample so again we got seven more potato leaf hoppers in the fourth sample which is a running total of 23 and again it falls between the n and the t in our fifth sample we got eight more potato leaf hoppers and ended up with a running total of 31 which was above our treatment number of 30 which you indicates you are over threshold. Many times when you're sampling potato leaf hoppers, they're either extremely high or very low. Generally, it does, you don't need to go out too many samples to, de to determine whether you're at a threshold or not. So if you are over threshold for potato leaf hopper and you're within a week of harvest, it is best to go in and harvest so you maintain the quality of the forage. When harvesting, make sure you uh, harvest all the forage in the field because if you leave a portion of the forage, it allows for a reservoir of potato leaf hoppers. So as the plants start to grow back, those, out, those leaf hoppers will infest those smaller plants and can cause damage to them. Another way to manage potato leaf hopper is to plant potato leaf hopper resistant alfalfa. It is now highly resistant and also maintains quality and yield. The last option if the alfalfa is not within a week of harvest or whether it's a new seeding, you may need to use an insecticide. In years where you have potato leafhopper populations, the resistant cultivars um, produce higher quality forage and out yield those that are susceptible as you can see in the photo. Um, there is no yield drag or quality drag with, with the newer um, potato leaf hopper resistant cultivars that are, uh, are for sale. Alfalfa that is resistant to potato leaf hopper, when it is in its seedling year, within the first month or so, it has not developed the resistance yet. So you can get populations of potato leaf hoppers on new. Uh, newly seeded alfalfa that is resistant in time but you will have to monitor it uh, as it gets to the point where it can actually resist the potato leaf hopper uh, populations. Another thing when you add other stresses such as drought, lack of moisture, um, can also enhance potato leaf hopper damage on alfalfa. When selecting a potato leaf hopper resistant cultivar, uh, first it's good to have it highly resistant. Second of all, you need to look at a bigger picture whether it's really adapted for here, um, whether it has resistance to certain diseases. You know, what is the best package of traits for you and your farm? If an insecticide is needed, 
Um, you can consult your Cornell guide for integrated crop management. And then again, follow the label and make sure that the crop and the insect pest is on that label. And it is registered in New York. The next pest we will discuss is clover root cuculeo, which may be one of the worst pests of alfalfa that we can do not a whole lot about. Clover root cuculeo is a tiny little um, beetle that has kind of like a broad snout and um, it's about 3 16 of an inch long. It can be brown to black. Um, feeding by adults does not really cause any economic damage. Clover root cuculeo adult females will lay their eggs in and around the crown of the plant on the soil surface. The larvae that hatch are kind of a cream color with a reddish head. The larvae will move down into the soil and feed on the taproot, creating openings that allow diseases to enter, which is the primary way a lot of the stand decline can occur within a field. As you can see from the larvae on the left, can cause damage to the uh, taproot um, on the right here, where you have scarring and, and openings in the root allowing diseases to enter. Another, as you as you leave a field um, and you go to another field, try to keep the key equipment clean so you're not moving adults from one field to another. Insecticides do not control the larvae that are in the soil. From this slide, you can see the life cycle of the clover cuculeo. So in April and May, the eggs will hatch and larvae will start to be uh, feeding on the roots. Adults can also be found in the foliage. The larvae will pupate from May through July. Adults will emerge in the field um, from June through July and then adults kind of become somewhat less active or dormant through the hotter part of the summer. And, and towards the fall the adults will mate, lay eggs around the crown of the plant again and then the adults and eggs can overwinter. Currently there is not a lot of management options for clover root cuculeo. Again it's one of the, the reasons why we have stand decline in alfalfa. Um, one method would be to shorten rotations if you do have a problem with it in a field and your stand counts uh, are reduced. Our next pest I will discuss is pea aphids. Pea aphids are about a sixteenth of an inch. The best way to tell them apart from other insects is to look with a hand lens and you can see little tailpipes or what we call cornicles coming off the back end of the aphid. It's a giveaway that that is an, some species of aphid. These are a little bit larger than a lot of other aphids and they vary in color. Um, they have a piercing sucking mouth part. Uh, they put it into the phloem of the plant, suck out the sugars, and replace it with their saliva. Pea aphids are kind of a minor to moderate pest of alfalfa in the northeast. Generally do not cause yield losses. And one of the reasons is it has a lot of natural enemies. Um, a few of the other aphids that do attack um, alfalfa are the blue alfalfa aphid and the spotted alfalfa aphid. Again, there are many, many natural enemies of aphids in alfalfa. Some of these include lady beetles, um, lacewings, um, predatory stink bugs, carabid beetles, um, spiders, parasitoids, nabids, there's a lots and lots of predation um, on aphids in alfalfa which um, may be one of the reasons why it's, it's kind of a minor to moderate pest of alfalfa. Purdue University did develop some threshold levels for pea aphids in alfalfa and um, as you can see here on the left um, you take 20 sweeps of the net in five locations in the field. If you have zero aphids, you're low. If you have less than a half a cup, you're light. If you have a half to one cup moderate and more than one cup, you have heavy. They suggest that you only treat moderate to heavy populations 
and if less than 10% of the aphids are parasitoids and you're not finding predators in the field. And that stems on average are shorter than 14 inches. Again, aphids very rarely cause yield losses in alfalfa in the northeast. The last pest we will discuss is alfalfa snout beetle. Alfalfa snout beetle is only found in the United States in northern New York. This is a very serious pest of alfalfa, making it very difficult to grow alfalfa where it occurs in northern New York. This is one of the few pests that can completely destroy an alfalfa field. This is rather a large beetle relative to some of the other pests that we look at in alfalfa. It's about a half an inch long. The adults are kind of like a model gray and they're humpbacked and these do not fly and all are females. So they are parthenogenic. They produce their own offspring without a male. The adults emerge in the spring um, and they can emerge at large numbers, but uh, it is rather a small part of the full population that is actually in the soil as larvae. What's interesting about these beetles is when they emerge in the spring, they can migrate in mass numbers and they only migrate in a northeast or northwest direction. The larvae themselves that feed on the roots are, are white in color. They're legless. They're about a half an inch long. They can be found down to a foot deep in late to midsummer. They feed on the roots and that they can girdle a taproot and kill a plant. As you can see from this larvae feeding on an alfalfa root, it can girdle the taproot, basically rendering the plant dead. Signs of alfalfa snout beetle damage are yellow, yellowing plants, dead plants, and missing plants. What's interesting is that I've seen fields in their second year of production that should have a field full of alfalfa basically look very similar to this one on the right with a lot of missing plants. Alfalfa snout beetle has a rather long and complicated life cycle. So let's say year one from April through May, adults emerge from the soil. They feed a little bit on foliage, but don't really cause a whole lot of damage. And then they can migrate in mass numbers. Within year one, from May to June, adults stop feeding. They lay eggs in alfalfa fields, again at the base of the plant, um, right around the crown. An adult is capable of laying about 500 eggs. So June through October, larvae hatch from the eggs and they start feeding on the roots. And you can see the symptoms uh, by the end of the summer relative to the damage that they can do. Still within the first year, as you start approaching winter, larvae will go uh, deeper in the soil to avoid the frost line. As you can see from the graph, the larvae do not come out of the ground when you hit the second year. They are still in the soil, feeding on the roots. You start to see symptoms of, the, of what we showed earlier. And sometimes it's mistaken as winter kill. You have missing plants, um, dead plants in the field from you know April through May. Within that second year, from June to August, a lot of those larvae will remain in diapause, um, but will start to develop into an adult. After pupating and becoming an adult, they will remain in the soil until the next spring where they will emerge um, as an adult. While alfalfa snout beetle likes alfalfa, it can also survive on red clover, docks, wild carrots, quack grass, and white clover. Some of the um, crops that they will not feed on are corn, wheat, oats, soybeans, potatoes, and bird foot trefoil. When detecting alfalfa snout beetle issues, you'll want to sample plants that look like they've been winter killed, they're yellowing in the spring, when they should be actually be uh, vibrant and green. You'll want to dig about 10 to 12 inches deep uh, where the plants are yellowing and dying and 
you could find larvae, pupae, and adults all within that profile. Again, symptoms say in late summer for alfalfa snout beetle appear yellow um, and often leafless plants. Management of alfalfa snout beetle can be rather difficult. One way to uh, limit the population in an area is to shorten up your rotation, say grow alfalfa two years or three seasons and uh, rotate with a non-susceptible crop like corn or soybeans. Shorter rotations don't allow the population to build to high levels in a field. Many times new infestations occur where gravel and soil and even hay bales that had infestations of the uh, beetle had been moved to. So if you could limit that would help not infest those non-infested areas. Insecticides are not effective against alfalfa snout beetle. There is a way to control this insect pest with nematodes that are effective at controlling alfalfa snout beetle. These nematodes are native to New York State and they can be applied on alfalfa fields and they do, once you apply them, they do persist from year to year. For more detailed information you can view the uh, publication listed on this slide. You can make decisions on whether to rotate an alfalfa field or not by assessing the stand itself. I'm going to present two different methods of assessing an alfalfa stand. This is a guide to where you take a square and go into the field that's um, two, two feet by one feet and count the number of crowns within a stand. This was developed at Cornell University and what they do it is they looked at what is the optimum stand for the year of production and what is an adequate stand for year of production. Stands decline in time and this kind of gives you an indication of whether you should rotate or not. So let's look at just uh, the spring seeding. An optimum stand is 25 to 40 crowns per square foot. An adequate stand is 12 to 20. If it falls below that, you may consider rotating or planting something else there. This guide also shows you your first year, second year, and third year. Generally, after your fourth year, most alfalfa fields are rotated. I actually prefer a, a method developed by the University of Wisconsin where you actually count the number of stems per square foot versus just the crowns. Sometimes a plant can be uh, not healthy but still be there. When a plant is healthy it has a lot of stems so I think the number of stems per square foot is maybe a better indication of the health of a field than maybe the number of crowns per square foot. So in this example if you have more than 55 stems per square foot you are not limiting yield based on the plants in the field. If you have 40 to 54 stems per square foot, you're having some yield reduction, but you still have a pretty good healthy field of alfalfa. If you are under 39 plants per square foot, they suggest um, possibly rotating that field, unless it has some grasses mixed in that you prefer or want, um, might consider rotating it. Here are some examples of some stand counts I had done several years ago and I had taken pictures of them. This was a four-year-old uh, stand of alfalfa. It had seven crowns per square foot and also 25 cents per square foot. Had kind of low potential for yield for alfalfa. This field of alfalfa was more than four years old um, and had very low yield potential. It had five crowns per square foot and also 15 stems per square foot. This is an interesting example of why you may want to assess the field because generally we rotate after four years but after I went into this field and analyzed uh, the number of crowns per square foot and, and stems per square foot it was still within uh, that area where you would want to keep it as a field and still had yield potential. Here's an example of a new seeding with a high plant population of 
20 crowns per square foot and also 70 stems per square foot. By analyzing uh, your plant population of alfalfa or stems per square foot or crowns per square foot, whatever which way you want to do it, it's a good way to determine what fields you can identify that probably need to be rotated to something else. This concludes this course on um, IPM for insect pests of alfalfa. Please take the post test.